Mark, man, thank you so much for coming on the show here today. Excited to have you back on. For somebody that has no clue who you are, could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so the let's do the high level, the quickie overview. So okay, uh, my name is Mark Fisher. I live in the New York City area. Most people know me for running a very eccentric gym in Midtown Manhattan <laughs> called Mark Fisher Fitness that had the distinction of both having a fair amount of business success over the years, but also being a very unusual brand that was mm -hmm. to some extent born out of my adventures and community as a member of the Broadway community, but also of what I often refer to as the teenation.com slash strengthcoach.com slash perform better corner of fitness. So mm -hmm. the whole shtick was I wanted to give serious fitness but in a way that was interesting to the people that I cared about. So we pride ourselves in being very nerdy about best, best practices for technical movement and program design and nutrition coaching and behavior change. But the brand is known because our mascot is the unicorn and the colors are crazy and we call our members ninjas and we don't call it a gym. <laughs> it's the enchanted ninja clubhouse of glory and dreams. So we are very... <laughs> We take the work very seriously. We don't take ourselves very seriously. And we wanted to deliver the work of the people that I looked up to and considered mentors, but in a way that was accessible to members of the New York theater community and other assorted misfit toys, which I, which I say with a lot of love and care. <laughs> so yeah, that is the thing that a lot of people probably have heard of me for if they've heard of me. But over the past several years, I've started doing a lot of coaching, consulting, and speaking specifically on the business of fitness. So running training gyms like Mark Fisher Fitness, um, and that company is called Business for Unicorns, where we both have a coaching group. And that's ostensibly the banner that I fly when I do speaking events at places like Perform Better or you know the various events on the circuit. And then sure. most recently, I have started a third company that is opening up units of an emerging small group personal training franchise called Alloy. So some people may have heard of the, the guy running his name, Rick Mayo, very smart dude been in the game a long time. He had a small group training license model that he turned into a franchise. And when I saw that was happening, uh, he's always somebody I thought was a savvy guy. And I decided I wanted to go in on that. So I had the opportunity to invest in that with an operating partner. And we are currently opening up our very first location in Northern New Jersey. So all of the say fitness and businessy <laughs> kind of person. I run a gym in New York City. I'm opening a bunch of units in New Jersey of another brand. I coach, consult, blah, blah, blah. That's that's my shtick and that's sort of the world that I come from. Yeah. Dude, you have so many irons in the fire. <laughs> I mean two businesses yeah, weren't yeah, enough. Yeah, hey, yeah. let's let's get a third going. Let's see what yeah. we can oh, do. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that's oh, exciting, yeah. man. It's a stool. I don't that's want to exciting. fall over. I need the third leg of my stool. That's right. See? So <laughs> pragmatic. Okay, so you and I discussed this before the show. It's wild to think about because it doesn't seem like this long, but it's been five years since you were last on the show. Yeah. So I'd love to hear yeah. just what the heck is new with you, man? What is new in the last five years? Yeah, I mean, certainly the, you know, the second two businesses weren't real. I mean, Alloy was definitely not a thing that long ago. Right. Um, certainly Business for Unicorns was maybe just kicking going, but we really didn't put a lot of, I don't want to say we didn't put effort into it. I mean, when we were fulfilling, we put a lot of effort into it, but we weren't really thinking in any intentional way of marketing or growing. It was just sort of people would come to us and they wanted some coaching stuff and we loved to talk about it. So we figured out something to do with them. And in fact, in 2018, mm -hmm that business was not even specifically niche to training gym owners. So even that's relative, I want to say okay. in the past two years where we finally took our own medicine. Yeah. And that was an interesting, uh, I think, experience, interesting transition in part because the takeaway there, which is marking 101, is you can't be all the thing to all the people. You, you can, yep. but it's probably better to land than expand. And what it meant practically for us was we basically had to cut off a lot of business because we were doing a lot of hired gun consulting in other industries. We had a lot of people coming to a lot of the courses that were not in fitness. We had like a weird niche doing time management for real estate agents. So ah. we just felt that for that business to grow, we just had to get really clear on who we were talking to. So we could get really clear on what their pain points were and their problems were. So we create very specific sure. solutions. Now, of course, it's hilarious. I know, Mike, you mentioned that you watch my YouTube channel and it's 
almost a joke to me. Yeah. I be, if I just didn't say the word gym owner, like almost none of it is different, you know, like, cause I don't really touch the program <laughs> I, design absolutely. stuff. You know, like I send like the fulfillment piece, like, uh, listen, I have opinions. I was a personal trainer for a long time, but it would be disingenuous at this point to say, I really feel like that's really where my expertise lies. I'd much rather send people to people like yourself if there's questions on that piece. And certainly the fulfillment stuff is important, but you'll know watching that YouTube channel, I niche it because I always say, hey, gym owners. And when you're running your gym, do ba do ba do But in practice, it's virtually identical to anything you would do, admittedly, in any comparable size service business that's in a brick and mortar location and it's a comparable size staff. And even then, a lot of the principles are, are broadly applicable almost to any kind of business. But as it happens, gym owners are my people because it's who I am. It's, it's who I yeah. know. Uh, and frankly, and this is part of the dance I have with my business partner, Michael, you know, who's a super smart guy. He's like getting his, uh, he's just picked up his second master's. He's getting his doctor right now and leadership of change management. Oh, you know, Kier's like a super smart dude. So for him, it's like, we can do lots of stuff. And like, I know, I know we can, but I don't know. Also, like, I feel for me, I don't mind being in a sandbox where I feel like, okay, I really know this sandbox. I know what I'm talking about here. Yeah. I have the scars to prove it. Uh, that's not to say that I don't think that I could be universally helpful for someone from different industries, but you know, I just know my people and I know who I am and I know who I've been. And I think like a lot of us, you know, to some extent we're always building this business out of like coaching, you know, myself from, you know, three to 10 years ago. Um, and it's been a, just an absolute pleasure and a joy to work with other people with similar gyms. Cause it's also all the stuff I think about every day, right? I'm so interested, you know, and that's I yeah. think part of my unique sauce is, you know, I'm operating an independent brand. I'm speaking and doing a little bit of consulting for like larger fitness structures, like outside of our world, like in the big box gym world, right? I'm yep. opening up fitness franchises of a small group personal training model, <laughs> not in New York city, now in a very different market. So I like to think that gives me a little bit of a unique perspective in the space as far as me sharing you know, ideas what people might do because it's like not theoretical. It's like I'm still most of my income make is made as somebody operating uh, not one but multiple different brands in different markets. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really interesting, and I think we're similar in the sense that one of the things that's given me credibility over the years is I've worked in so many different areas of fitness. Like I've done rehab, I've done one on one in home training, yeah. I've done small group, I've done large mm -hmm. group, I've worked with athletes, I've done gin pop. So when you see all that, it gives you this unique perspective. So like you, when you go in and you talk to somebody about their fitness business, you're like, you'll <laughs> maybe this isn't exactly how I run my business, but I've seen businesses like this. Yes. It just gives you this higher level view of this is what you probably need to be focusing on. Yeah, I, I think that's true, you know, because I think as anyone listening, this is maybe like a very high level career development takeaway there is this concept of moving from liquid intelligence to more crystallized intelligence, which is to say mm. that in the beginning, you have a certain number of skills. If you're on the younger side, part of what we need from you as a society, as an industry, is we need your brashness, we need your creativity, we need your innovation, we need you to do things that are largely stupid and a reflection <laughs> of your naivete. But sometimes you're like, oh no, that's new. You And you didn't know what the box was, so you weren't even thinking about the box like you did new things. Right. For me, yeah. at this point in my career, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm likely into the second half of things, which is very bizarre. I hope in my second half will be twice as long as my first half, but I yeah. hope that what I can offer at this point, and you know, I suspect you might resonate with some of this yourself, Mike, is pattern recognition. Like I feel like yes. what's happened is I can now so quickly, and again, I have to be, we have to be thoughtful about that too, because that can come at its own cost where sometimes you fill in the blank because you think you've got to figure it out quickly and you actually miss an important detail if you don't remain curious, if you don't remain humble, yep. if you don't remain centered on what the client is telling you. But in practice, you know, there are things now that become practically very useful that even five years ago I couldn't have done. I wouldn't have been able to like at a glance look at a PL or like ask like four questions about your numbers, like, ah, okay, here's what's not working. Fix this yeah. and actually fix it in this order. Because if you do this other thing first, it'll create downstream issues. You're gonna start with X. Yeah. Just that domain expertise, right? You've been there long enough now, you've seen enough. You said P and L sheets or whatever. You just kind of know, like yeah, these are the yeah, things we need yeah. to be focusing on. Yeah. That's very cool. Yep. Okay. So, not to pick at a scab here, but I want to start with the obvious question. You own a gym in New York City. Oh yeah. And you oh, went yeah. through COVID. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
talk talk about that experience. What was that like for you? Because I know being a gym owner in Indiana was hard, and yeah. that's not New oh, yeah. York. That's oh, yeah. not L.A. So talk to me about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was horrible. It was uh, very challenging. You know, we couldn't do classes for. I think it was 18 months, 18 months who we weren't able to run oh any gosh. classes. But, you know, I'll have to say, I, I also, you know, I, listen, I don't, I don't want to dismiss that was a very challenging time. And I don't want to underplay. I was like deeply <laughs> struggling during many periods. Yeah. It was like definitely one of the darkest periods of my life. But at the same time, yeah. you know, post-traumatic growth is a thing. There is an opportunity to take some really lessons. And in my case, the other thing that is interesting is, there were some things about MFF at that time that really, in retrospect, were not working. As, as much as I loved the business, it had become a little bit calcified. And there mm. were some changes that needed to be made that without that opportunity to really rip off Band-Aids, I don't think were going to get made. So that's interesting. Now, I'll, I'll tell you this. One of the things that is fascinating and a little bit interesting here is, in many ways, we are absolutely still dealing with the fallout of COVID years, years later. And the reason is because we went online because we had no mm -hmm. other choice. And frankly, it was an awesome opportunity and it wound up being this amazing, incredible business, but it was one that was definitely not sustainable. But I'll tell you what, in 2023, we still have several hundred members doing Zoom only online workouts. Well, like I said, wow. I'm, a co I'm a consultant in this space, Mike. I don't know anybody that kept doing Zoom workouts after August of 2020. And here we no. are three years later, and that has been both amazing and we've learned a ton and is its own set of challenges, right? Because at the peak, that program, I think at one point we had 800 members doing online oh my Zoom workouts. Yeah, it was Looney Tunes. It was Looney Tunes. Wow. Wow. And since then, you know, frankly, it's been a little bit of catching a night for several years because we know that that program is going to slowly bleed out. And, you know, if you're losing a few clients every month and not really able to replace them, because at this point, we certainly have some people come back. I don't want to make it sound like there's no sales, but none of our marketing sales effort is focused on it because in 2023, you're not going to get a lot of cold lead gen that makes it all the way to the membership that's going to be spending 200 plus dollars per month for Zoom workouts of 35 people, even though for our right. members and people in the community, it can be a great, in some situations, the preferred offering that we have. And I'm really appreciative that people like it. I, I'm very proud of it for what it is. There's obvious limitations. I don't need to tell this particular audience that don't thrill me as a fitness <laughs> professional. But in practice, right. it's a good solution for a lot of people that crave the that crave that uh, particular set of features and benefits. So, you know, we, we fast forward to now that is the interesting moment of current because we're still, you know, servicing this revenue and, yeah. you know, still kind of coming back in many ways for the in-person MFF. But what I'll tell you is on the back end, you know, without getting into like the mind numbingly boring nitty gritty for most listeners, it's a much healthier <laughs> business, which is to say, you know, it's a lot less people with a lot simpler systems, with a lot clearer SOPs and numbers that just make a lot more sense, right? And I wouldn't yeah. say the numbers didn't make any sense in 2018, but in practice, and to, to my defense, I think I kind of always knew this too, and I think this was the last thing I needed before I really started putting myself out there as a business coach. We were succeeding in some situations because of the uniqueness of what we are and were and what we did. And because yes. of that, we just got away with a lot of things that nobody else would be able to get away from. You just, you just couldn't get away with a lot of the things we did as far as the amount of staff we had and, you know, even things like, you know, these nice to have things and these customer service systems that looked really cool and were probably good, nice to have. So I don't know if they were really adding value, really moving the ball forward. You know, now, of course, it's so interesting because, and I think, Frank, I need to be thoughtful about not overcorrecting for this. I've become so obsessed with like lean or lean or lean or lean or you know, right. and part of it is because I did it wrong. You know, so when I look at people's businesses as a gym owner, they tend to, in ways I think are unhelpful, anchor their sense of success and their desire for growth in how many people can I hire? You know, how big of a square footage can I have? How many services yeah. can I offer? And it's all like the wrong way. If you want a business that, yeah. you know, is optimized for simplicity, which means it has the potential of scale. 
you want to you want to simplify those things. You actually want to ask yourself, okay, what is the lowest square footage I can service these sessions in? What is the how do I have less people that I pay more money, right? Because you want less humans, yeah. but ideally they're all getting a, a slightly larger cut of the pie. And then you want a business yep. where there is a sufficient amount of leftover, so that as the owner, you are appropriately compensated for any work in the business, if you're doing work in the business, and then at the owner level, the investor level, you are compensated for the investments you've made and for the risk that you incur as the owner of that business. So yeah, so it made an interesting, interesting journey, but a lot of, a lot of good lessons. And it, it sort of, you know, I, I think my last thing I'll say is I think it forced me to grow up. I, I had to really grow yeah. up as a business owner because I had no choice because I had a dagger in my yeah. throat. <laughs> And I yeah. think I did. So, yeah. so thanks, COVID, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's it's just so refreshing to hear you say some of those things too because, man, we've been around long enough. We've seen the people that have made the mistake of, I'm going to start with the 20K square foot space. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I'm trying to oh, hire yeah. all my friends and family and you got 15 yeah. employees and like 10 people that are actually on auto pay and paying you yeah. money every month. It's, it's just so refreshing to hear that because I think a lot of people are sold, especially now in the social media, Instagram, TikTok day, check out this awesome space and da, 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 versus dude, we started in, Bill and I started in 2,200 square feet. Yep. Like, like literally the smallest space that we could find 1500 bucks a month. People yep. laugh. That's yep. Indiana money <laughs> yep. in, in 2008. But like, Hey, it was he and I small space. Like, how do we just get this yeah, off perfect. the ground? and make sure it actually works. Yeah, for sure. And, and listen, you know, I, I'm certainly not poo-pooing like a, a go big or go home strategy. I, I, I can, to some extent, see that. It's just in my experience, most people are best with more of a land than expand strategy, right? Get your proof of concept, keep your overhead low enough. Um, and again, like listen, we we're talking specifically about real estate is a little bit market dependent based on what you envision with the long-term growth of the business. I've just seen again and again that I've rarely seen the real core issue is that the space is too small or I don't have enough employees, right? Gotcha. Or that my expenses yeah. are too low, which is like a flipping way of saying <laughs> the same thing. Like I just haven't usually yeah. seen that be an issue. I, I guess I could like, listen, if you're like a super, super cheapy, you know, and the space is literally too small or it's like so decrepit or you've chosen a location that no one absolutely no will go to. Like uh, there, there right. could be some considerations there. I have just found those sins to be less common than the sins of just starting out a little bit too big for your breaches. Um, and then of course, also opening up with no real understanding of how we grow the business, right? And that's a very common trainer right. mistake is, I've had success as a trainer, I don't really know a lot about marketing, I don't really know the whole business, I'm not that interested <laughs> in it, but I, my boss is a jerk and also I don't understand why he's getting you know most of the money that I'm making for these lessons on services. I'm gonna open up my own gym. And, you know, listen, right. you can start and to, again, listen, forgive me, father, for I have skin, sinned. I, it's not that far from how I started, right? Like I, <laughs> you know, the first thing that yeah. a lot of the success we had, particularly in the beginning was right time, right place. And we did a lot of things right too, but there was, a, you know, a big element of luck in the, the, just the opportunity at the time. So I do think there's something to be said for opening up a gym with a bunch of seed clients, right? So if you're a personal trainer and you've got a, a book that, that can be super, super valuable, but that's not how one intentionally grows a business. If you want to do this 10 years, if you want to do this 20 years, you're not usually going to be able to rely on like, yep, I just, I'll just i be great and people will bring people to me. Um, you know, and again, unless you're building a model around yourself. So some of our listeners might have a similar model to this that I think can be an, a, not a bad way to go. It's not the way I probably want to go or that I necessarily would encourage, but where you're a personal trainer, you rent a teeny space, so you got like a room so you can do your training in. Yep. You maybe have two part-time trainers that are okay, or maybe you rent out the space to two other trainers that run a book in your gym and they pay you enough to offset some of your expenses. Well, listen, you can have a lot of freedom to make a pretty good living that way, right? Now, the thing that is true about that is yep. you're, you, you are certainly paying dollars for hours at that point, right? So I'm not going to say that's not yeah. a business. Sometimes people say, oh, if you're working, it's not a business. Like, well, that's, that's not true. Like you, any business is going to require some kind of effort. You know, very, it's very rare. You're an owner of a business that literally nothing to do with the operation, particularly these <laughs> size of businesses. But I just want to highlight this right. because the other thing I have observed to be true as I'm, you know, <laughs> wheezing, wheezing, come sit on my lap child. Let me tell you grandchild about the olden <laughs> days. What I will tell you is the things that are thrilling to you as a single 29 year old trainer or single 33 year old trainer with a girlfriend and no kids 
and are, and are renting an apartment are maybe not thrilling to you as a 47 year old trainer with three kids and a mortgage and a wife and aging parents and all the things that start to happen in the messy middle. Right. So I would encourage right. people listening right. to this as they think where they might want to go. I know there's a lot of people that, you know, are trainers that work in other businesses. And, and by the way, an employee is, can, can be a solid way to go based on your market, based on your setup. Sometimes like that's actually the best move. I'm not an advocate for everybody opening up their business. I think a lot of that is overstated because there's some motivated reasoning of, uh, frankly, when you do the thing that I do, there's more clients. If I can get you to do it, <laughs> but I don't want you to do it unless it's going to be good for you. And it's not always going to be good for you. Um, right. And, <laughs> you know, and certainly like, listen, you can, you can back out things. I'm certainly not saying that you can't change your mind. I'm just saying that there is the anchoring that I've just seen over my time in the business where it's just so hard for 28 year old personal trainer to really think through who they're going to be, right? And that's effective forecasting one-on-one. -on -one. It's sort of one of the primary things yeah. we know about human psychology is people are not great at forecasting how they will feel in the future in part because they will be a different person at that time, right? So yeah. I, I just want to offer, if you're listening, you're on the younger side and you know, you know, maybe you will be the person like, listen, I'm thrilled to be a personal trainer into my sixties and that's all I need to do. And I'm not interested in building uh, any sort of business on that. I will truly just train down clients and I will be in there 50 hours a week and definitely. There is a, a small percentage of people that wind up like that. I would just say it's a, it's a vanishingly small percentage. And what I can tell yeah. you is when you're, again, the, the younger trainers in my experience offer all convinced or 90% convinced that, that that's gonna be me. Like, I'm good, just give me. Uh, and again, I know, cause I, I, I kind of was that trainer, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> You know, I had yeah. some sense that I was going to change my mind maybe, but, you know, admittedly also, right. I think for me when I was younger, and I think maybe this is maybe true, uh, you know, you, you don't always think as on long of a time scale as I start to do as I got a little bit older, I start to be able to like really think, okay, like how do I want this? Like, you know, I got X many decades. How am I going to use this? How do I balance, you know, my personal goals as well as my professional goals? And so anyway, just yeah. some things to consider for the listeners. No. No, that's great. And it's it's weird because, okay, I mean, showing my age, I'm 45 now. I can honestly say I haven't started to think about like the back half of my career until the last year or two. You know, like when you're young, you just think about like these five or 10 year segments. And yeah. even still, yeah. you and I both know a lot can change in five to 10 years, oh, like yeah. a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But now that I'm thinking, okay, what what does my career look like in 10 years or 20 years? How does that change? How does that evolve? Yeah. I haven't had those thoughts until recently. Yeah. So if you can yeah. start thinking about that and being somewhat cognizant of, hey, I'm probably going to change a little bit in the next 20 years. What do I want that to look like? So you can have some some impact behind that and you can kind of choose that direction yourself being forced in a direction. I think it would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, if okay. anybody's interested uh, in emailing, I'm sure I'll get my email at the end of this, but just market businessfreeunicorns.com. I have like a five-year visioning sheet that I can give you that I think is useful because I do Ooh. think that visioning is a skill that you can get better at over time. And I think there are some frameworks that can make it uh, more effective because you won't be great in the beginning, number one. And then number two, plans never work, but planning always does. So I think the actual planning process yeah. is, is very valuable, right? You know, but it, it is interesting at this point, yeah. you know, similar to you, Mike, it's, it's so in many ways, drastic way the past couple of years, things have really shifted for me. I think part of it is maybe having um, a daughter and part of it is, frankly, I don't feel like I quite have the energy I did. I don't quite have the interest that I did. So it's also not a secret. Uh, yeah. You know, listen, I don't want to sound like I'm fat cat over here. Like, oh, I'm like, now I'm like investor mode. I guess <laughs> I'm an equity advisor and I smoke cigars and I own businesses. And I, my minions go and do my work while I chill. <laughs> like I, I work my ass. Yeah. Off. I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm not working at all. And I'm still interested in operating, but at this point I'm far more interested in creating those results through other people. So my focus yeah. is much more on how do I find, hire and develop people that in a very mutually beneficial way, I can help create opportunities for them. They can grow professionally and personally, and they can share in some of the upside of this thing that we're collaborating on. Yeah, dude, this is going to actually go perfectly into my next question because you and I had this kind of quick email conversation. I ask every guest, is there something you'd really like to talk about? Something you're passionate about? And you mentioned creating a business that allows you freedom via leadership. And yeah. that really caught my eye. Talk to me a little bit about that. How do we do that? Yes, yeah, so I think the 
lowest hanging fruit here, right? So I obviously just described one path, right? I'm a little bit further on the journey at this point. So most of you, it, it'll take a hot second to get where I'm at. But I think the first step from that is the very, very first step is even if you're a personal trainer, if you're a personal trainer and you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe this doesn't apply to me. Uh, you know, I'm an employee and I make like, okay money, but I'm not really sure how I could leverage some of this. I think even somebody that's just training sessions, even as an employee, I'm not even talking about doing what I did for years of like renting space in a gym. My bet is there's anywhere from three to five hours of administrivia that you could potentially <laughs> outsource, right? And it, listen, maybe if you're like yeah. an employee and you're in a good place, like oftentimes that's kind of the deal. They're taking a lot of that off of your plate. But like, so let's say like you run a modest personal training business and you train clients on your own. Well, the reality is you're going to be dealing with scheduling. You're going to be dealing with billing. You might be needing to do some sort of content marketing of which, you know, you'll be responsible for not just creating, but there's like the posting, there's the responding, there's dealing with all yeah. the various tech software platforms that you have to deal with. <laughs> so I would say even for someone that considers themselves just a personal trainer, quote unquote, you could likely start to get back some of that time and outsource three hours, five hours, maybe even as much as 10 hours per week, obviously depends on what you do. And there, these days, that is another thing that I've seen sh a sharp change since the old pandemic is they are ubiquitous, these various virtual assistant solutions, and you can find them virtually at any pay scale. Now I'd say the more you can leverage automation, that always is the first move, right? Mm -hmm. If you can leverage yeah. automation and you can have like a scheduling link or a booking billing platform, that's always your first move. But at a certain point, you're gonna get to the place where like, okay, I need an actual human. And whether that is working with a foreign virtual assistant that can be, in some situations, you can find people for like very affordable, like really dollars per hour. Or if you yep. want some of the more high power, like I have an executive assistant I had through a company called Freedom Makers. And, you know, Joy is not cheap, but I, I needed somebody a little more resourceful for what I needed. I needed somebody coming with batteries included that's very resourceful that I can be like, Joy, I don't know how to do this thing. I don't actually want to learn how to do this thing. I need you to figure this thing out. And here's the outcome. <laughs> Let me know if you need help. And Joy is incredible. She's, uh, she yeah. saves my life every day. So, so I think that's your first step, right? If you're a personal trainer. Now, if you are, let's say a gym owner, even in a modest size facility, well, now, now there's two things. I think, first of all, you certainly have a lot of ministry if you need help with, right? You certainly have a lot of ministry if you need help with. And again, I'm like three to five, 10 hours per week. That'd be a game changer for most of the people listening to this. And depending on what your hourly rate is, depending on what sort of competency you need with this individual, you, you in many situations can afford it, right? And for a lot of you, yeah. if you are that personal trainer, well, listen, if you do one or two hours on the floor, you're probably more than making up for, from a revenue perspective, what the expense is of whatever this virtual yeah. assistant is, right? So that's, I think, yeah. the next piece when you're that you know contractor and you've kind of got your own gym and things will start to get a little bit more complex. I think the next step up from there I will offer, right, is then you need to have a sous chef or the hand of the king. So if you have mm -hmm. a gym that is realistic, even if you have a very modest model, right? If you want to be able to take vacations, if you want to be able to turn off some days, sometimes, which I think is absolutely mandatory for your long-term sustainability, you'll need someone yeah. else that is your right hand, right? I often call this a sous chef because if anyone's familiar with the way kitchens work, you often have a head chef and then you have a sous chef who's kind of responsible for the day to day. So elevating one person, even a team of three or four or five people that you give them the responsibilities and importantly, let them buy into the dream with you, right? And in most situations, some sort of, and it could be very modest upside, right? Depending on the way your gym is structured in your market, I'm not talking about like, you're gonna make this person a millionaire, but they get some sort of compensation, whether it be an increase in modest increase in base pay or some sort of maybe even there's some sort of bonus share of some kind. So there's someone else that is willing and able and is happy to unclog a toilet or to answer a situation if something happens on a weekend and you, you've communicated in advance, you're going to have family time or you want to go to a vacation for a week with your family. There's someone else you can trust to mind the store while you're gone. Now, of course, because you're a very good yeah. person, you'll do that for them too, right? So they will also have opportunities where you will mine the store for them, right? And I think sure. even for people with modest aspirations and modest size gyms, right? The classic training gym, which in some markets, you know, maybe you're doing 300K per year, 
three fifty k per year, which is completely doable and not that that's not really dreaming. I don't know exactly what y'all are doing, but like that's actually not really dreaming that big. It's definitely doable in most markets. There should be enough yes. meat on the bone that you can do that, but you have to be intentional about finding one person that has the skill set that your clients and the rest of your staff will look to as your your right hand person. And that's not even a GM. It's probably like a trainer. Right. And a lot of these models, probably trainer that's on the floor and maybe they're on the floor a few hours less and they're paid a little bit more because they have this different level of responsibility um, and to be able to be your proxy. So uh, I'll pull up there. But I think based on where you're at in your career, those are some of the ways you start to create freedom by leveraging other people. Yeah. So with that being said, how do you either a identify that person from within your company or b go about finding the right person from outside your company and bringing yeah. that person in. I can see the yes. value in that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it really does depend on the model. And sometimes this is, this full stop, this is an issue we run through sometimes in the yeah. gyms, because again, you don't have tons of employees. Sometimes you don't have that person. And perversely, yeah. uh, this is not always the case, but but doesn't it always seem that the person that wants the job doesn't actually have the skill set? And the person who could yeah. do it has the skill set doesn't actually want the job. So absolutely, that is a thing to <laughs> manage, right? You know, and if you really, uh, in a perfect world, you know, you'll see. I think if you're working with employees, like who has potentially the capacity, and ideally for dialogue with people on your teams, I would encourage you to do about what their plans are for two years out, five years out. What do they want for their life? You might have some sense if there's someone's in there, and it's never going to be 100 percent perfect but the advantage of this when you make that sort of promotion within your team you got a good idea what's going on i think it's a little bit more fraught when you hire from outside the business but yeah listen if you if you need to hire from outside the business i think this is frankly a, a good thing to consider anytime you're making a hire anyway any sort of job search is a different kind of marketing and sales campaign right you have to market what it is you have to sell them on the dream sell them on the opportunity and this ideally is going to be like a pretty cool job for someone that wants to work in fitness. They also want a little bit of status that goes along with this. Now, again, there's some people that it's not the right trade off. They're like, I don't care about sure. that. I don't care about a little more money. I don't care about status. I don't want the responsibility. And that's great because we also, you know, we need a sous chef. But we also need cooks, right? We need some people that are just like happy yeah. to like cook the eggs. They do a good job cooking the eggs. Now, if you're in a situation where let's say, you know, let's try to put some bones on this. You you have maybe three, you have two full-time coaches, you have two part-time coaches. You can't really afford to hire somebody else externally. And none of those people either have the capacity or have the interest in taking over for this position. Well, I'll say this. If, if nobody has the interest, there might be a world where you know you could figure out okay what would make it worthwhile for this person right because you know i realize you don't have unlimited capacity here there's some constraints so you might need to find a way to get creative to see can i actually get somebody interested in this and of course for this to work you'd have to actually make them sincerely interested it, it would have to really be worth their while what's not going to work is someone uh feeling like they're doing this kind of against their will under duress because what their boss wants they don't really <laughs> want to be doing the job like that's not going to work now here's where the right meets the road Let's say you don't, you're not in a place where you're able to make another hire. N neither your two full time trainers nor your two part time trainers seem to be the right kind of person for this. Well, now we have some decisions to make. Now we have some decisions to make. Again, this is difficult to go into great detail without understanding the context of your particular facility, of the relationships with those people, about how well they're performing. But yeah, in no uncertain terms, I think at a certain point, you might need to consider making a change of staff. And it might be, unfortunately, potentially having some people that you are not able to work with anymore because the needs of the business have changed. And I realize, listen, this is very yep. easy to talk about in abstract, you know. <laughs> it's very easy to talk about this in abstract. I'm like painfully aware when you're yeah. actually with humans, it's much harder. But in practice, sure, you are the only person that can create the life that you want. What I want to advocate for is if you have a small gym and if you feel like it's drowning you, and if you want a gym where you're able to make an impact for community and you're making what feels like a fair income for the effort you're putting in, and importantly, you have some freedom so the gym is not a cage, I'm just telling you that's yes. possible. The tons of people have yeah. that. It's totally doable. And you might have to really crack some eggs if in all honesty, you look at your team and you think, okay, I want this. 
truly no one can do this. Okay. Well then we need to have some, some, maybe some tough conversations about what that might look like. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great advice. It's great advice. And if you own your own business long enough, at some point you're going to have to let somebody go. Uh, yeah. I can say <laughs> almost every time it, it, the thought of it is awful. Doing it is awful, but there's also a sense of relief generally on oh, both yeah. sides oh, yeah. because oh, yeah. there's this like, they knew it was coming or they wanted it or whatever. 100%. We knew it was coming. We needed it. Okay. Everybody collectively exhale. Let's move on. And things are generally better in the long run. So, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, you know, firing people is definitely the least fun part of the job, but it's also true that if the person's not really thriving there, you're kind of doing them a favor. Furthermore, you're also yeah. usually negatively impacting your team. If there's somebody that's really dragging things down, it's a source of frustration for everyone around you. Um, yep. You know, it's interesting. I, I recently, I don't think it's live that I did a YouTube on this recently too, because one of the things that is so perverse is there, you will, there are oftentimes dynamics where the team is like, why is Jimmy here? What's wrong? Just, is the boss an idiot? Why are they or Jimmy? Jimmy's such a Jimmy sucks. Jimmy's an idiot. What's our boss an idiot too? And I don't I don't respect our boss. You should get rid of Jimmy, right? Because I, you know, it's the thing when you're down there, you think like, oh, it's so obvious, it's so easy, right? And then right. you fire Jimmy, and everyone's like, oh my god, he'll fire us for anything, and everyone's like freaked out, you know. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. So you know, that is a whole I think art for yeah. you know, gracefully letting people go. I, that's maybe a little bit niche for today's conversation, but but I think that is a skill yeah. set, unfortunately worth learning because if i'll tell you what yeah. if you run a, a business for 10 years and you never fire anyone you are the luckiest person to never live in the world or it's likely there are people that you know should be casting off for other shores that you have not done the honor yet of, yes with love sending them to their next adventure yeah agreed okay so you and i talked about this there's literally like 10 topics we could do so many different podcasts just about all the unique things <laughs> yeah. that you like to talk about but I don't think we have that kind of time. And I don't know if people want to listen to like a 10 hour podcast yeah, today either. Probably not, probably so not. what I want to do is kind of like rapid fire a couple different topics and things that you riff on and yep. just see where you're at on them. Great. So one thing I want to start with is time management. Obviously yep. a big topic, right? People do like seminars and webinars, mm -hmm. like all kinds of things talking about this. But I'd love to hear kind of from our niche and from our lens, what are some of the biggest time management issues that trainers, coaches, and gym owners are making? Yeah, gosh, I mean, it tends to be like pretty similar to most people. I would say that uh, a few things. The first thing that I think is valuable for most people to do is periodically every three to 12 months do what's called a time audit. There's a few different ways of doing it. The most common one, you just write down in painstaking detail over maybe a five to seven day period, open up a tab in your computer and just track in quarter hour increments how you're spending your time and then assess, is this reflective of my values? Is Am I using my, my time in a way that's moving me towards my goal? So I think uh, for many people, a great first step is just that awareness will usually lead yep. to some positive change, if admittedly also some sad feelings when you realize how much time you're spending doing X topic. So I think for a lot of people, having more awareness is the first step. I think secondly, creating your day the night before and being intentional about how you're going to spend yes. that day and then creating time blocks. So particularly as if you wind up having more and more time, uh, that can be confronting. And this is an interesting phenomenon, particularly for gym owners, right? Because to some extent, at least when you're on the floor 45 hours and you don't see your kids you know, your spouse hates you because they don't see you at all. Well, at least you know what you're doing. At least it's like, all right, well, I'm working 45 oh. hours and then I'm desperately doing a horrible job with this impossible task of <laughs> running the business in the remaining 15 hours per week I'm doing while I'm exhausted. Well, right. flash forward, now trainer gets down to 10 hours per week, right? Which is, you know, a little bit more manageable. I'm still on the floor a little bit. And sometimes there can be this anxiety around like, what's my job supposed to be? So at the very least, you know, answer maybe what to do in a moment. But at the very least, you want to be blocking your day so that you have appointments that you keep just like you would with a session, right? The advantage of a session is if Mrs. Rossini is waiting for you at 930, you're going to show up and you're going to train Mrs. Rossini. You're not going to just be like, yeah, eh, I didn't get around to it or like, yeah, right. I changed my mind, right? So I think having some rigor <laughs> around planning a day so that you can win the day, right? Something I harp on all time. You want to make a game you can win and it's a game. So it means there should be some challenge, but you should be able to win it. So if you can't win it at all, uh, we're playing too hard of a game, right? So 
with this day, then the next, I think, obvious question is, okay, well, how should I spend that time? And of course, the answer depends a little bit. But if, if crudely, high level crudely, for gym owners, it's probably uh, building the business, probably marketing, lead generating activity, sales generating activity. Certainly, there's also a place to work on fulfillment too. It has, however, been my experience that at least the people that I tend to attract and work with, I tend not to get the super boy, the room, hardcore sales people that don't really know much about <laughs> fitness and don't care much because at the end of the day, they only care about selling, selling, selling. I'm sure those guys are out there. I just don't think they choose to work with me. So, so strangely, yeah. I am in the strange position of like these wonderful hard center trainers and be like, you've got to market and sell more, but spending the time on things that will drive the business. I think becomes uh, very important once you get that free time, because then it becomes like a game because as your revenues increase and you have more clients, you have more bandwidth and more money to pay uh, your staff more, to pay better people, to potentially hire more people so that more and more of the things can be done to get the impact you want. Again, we're kind of echoing this sort of unintentional theme of leveraging other people to create more income, impact, yes. and freedom. But I think that's that's how to do it. So. I think I'll pull it there. I think those are two of the more common um, opportunities I see with how gym owners and trainers uh, address time. Yeah. Well, the things that I noted and things that I've seen over the years, when somebody does get free time, like you alluded to, there is sometimes this element of, oh, shoot, what do I do now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. How do I fill this time? And I think the immediate is the instant gratification, right? I'm going to be on email 38 times a day and I'm going to yeah. respond to somebody yeah. the second they right? So that you get that dopamine rush. Yeah. Obviously, that's yeah. not the best thing. And I know, I feel like you and I have talked about this, or I'm sure we both probably agree on the value of like the non urgent, but important tasks. Yes. yes. Right? You yeah. know, like the things that, you know, if I don't do it, maybe it makes a difference, maybe it doesn't. But like long term, you're hampering your own business. Yeah, like you have to like carve out those times and honor those times. Just like you said, if was it Miss Rossini? <laughs> you know, if Miss, if most, if Miss Rossini is waiting on you, she expects you to be there. Well, you yeah. know, if you're not working on your marketing calendar at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, yeah. your marketing calendar isn't offended, but your business is probably going to be negatively, yeah. negatively impacted down the line. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So make sure you do those things. Okay. Next on the docket is this idea of being profitable within your business, because I'm mm -hmm. sure. You have worked with numerous people that are literally week to week, month to month, like floating yep. along, but yep. they're slowly taking on water. Yeah. So kind of like the previous question, what are some of the biggest ways that trainers, coaches and business owners are shooting themselves in the foot with regards to keeping more of their hard earned money? Okay. Huh. Love this topic. Well, I, I will, I'll say this. First of all, I would love to know that if anyone's interested, I'm actually doing a whole training on this called how much should a gym owner make where I will go into uh, potentially mind numbingly painstaking detail about what these <laughs> benchmarks are. Um, we might be able to throw out the show notes or you can go to businessunicorns.com and you should be able to find it on the website. So the, uh, the most common ways I see this go awry are first of all, First of all, not knowing how to generate enough money in the first place, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna separate that bucket for a minute. But if you don't have enough revenue, at a certain point, it just it just doesn't matter, right? If you can't get to like a reasonable right. number of clients, a reasonable income, it we're not gonna be able to trim the other things down enough, right? It doesn't scale down indefinitely. But let's assume right. you're making so just for the, the sake of argument, let's assume you're making a decent amount of total revenue for your market. So the numbers yeah. I like to see, or where I see, you know, maybe the inversion of this, where I see people go most awry are, if the rent is too much, that is gonna be an issue, right? In fact, our businesses, it's mostly rent and people. Those are the two big expenses in yeah. a service business, so that's a brick and mortar. So the numbers I tend to look for is for rent. I wanna see it in a perfect world, if we can get down to 10% or lower, I think we can go up to 15. I think if you're in an urban market, I think up to 20 can be okay. Uh, starts to get a little scary there, but in some markets you need to do it, right? And, and I'll note briefly, I might say at the end of the day, the, the, actually the most important thing is, are you receiving a decent total owner compensation, both as a percentage of the revenue and or as absolute cash? So to speak to that briefly, the numbers I'm usually looking for there is 20 to 40%. Sometimes you could do a little bit more if you have a smaller business that's not mature. So what I mean is, yep. 
if the business is making, let's say hypothetically, $30,000, I'd love for you to be receiving anywhere from six to 12K per month in total owner compensation. And total owner compensation, okay. the way I define that, and people look at that differently, is a combination of three things. It's your payroll, it's your perks as an owner, things like a cell phone you can put through the business, and any owner distributions, which you might take on a quarterly, but sometimes monthly basis, right? So if you are okay. much below that, it's, it's not the end of the world. And I'd say this, you know, you, if you have to have like an enormous business and you're doing 15%, but you're making $350,000 per year and you're only working 15 hours per week. Okay. Well, that's, you know, you might be okay with that. That yeah. might not be a bad way to go. Right. right? Um, conversely, <laughs> right. if you're taking home 60% of the revenue, but you're only doing, you know, three and a half grand per month, Okay, well then you've hit your percentage goal, but that that's probably as an absolute dollar not going to be enough to live on virtually anywhere. So both sure. of those numbers matter. It's hard to talk about in generalities, but you know I want to highlight that because as I as I talk through some of these numbers, I tend to look for at the end of the day, if you hit the total owner compensation and you feel emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, you feel good, like you're being compensated for the stresses and efforts of running a business. You're good, right? Like you, you're the person that gets to decide that, right? So I'm giving you some benchmarks to think through, but, but you can decide. Um, I think yeah. when it comes to staff, we talked about this before, right? Over expanding staff. I like to see payroll or, or not even payroll, but really the full cost of people, which can also include your benefits at no more than 40% of the total revenue. So again, let's put some bones on this. So you're doing, you know, let's say 30K per month, um, so that means that we're not spending more than 12K on other people in the business. Yeah. And this depends on your education, the rubber you do, do. Now, the better, the sexier models, uh, you can get that down to 25%, right? So again, mm -hmm. this depends on your model, depends on your market. I think much below 25% and, and usually much below 30% is kind of hard to pull off because you get what you pay for, right? So if you're trying sure. to have like absolutely no staff and then you're trying to pay them dollars and expect them to really deliver to high level, that's probably not going to happen. So, but that is one of the places I tend to see over expansion. Here's another place, another version of this that I see quite often is offering too many sessions that build it and they will come mm. where you have, let's say six yeah. on one personal training model and you look in, you know, and usually I love you so much. You won't do this, but I will. When we talk to you, and I'll do it for you. And I'll look <laughs> in your booking and billing platform and be like, oh, you're averaging 1.3 clients per session. Okay. Well, that's not very good utilization. So yeah. we are likely in, in that situation in, in practice, what tends to be happening is the owner is now on the floor 35 hours per week when they could easily be on the floor 15 hours per week. And then all yep. those, those clients f flesh out better. Now I understand it's hard to take things away. You made a mistake. It's harder. It's harder to fix it. Now it's going to be okay. People will be mad at you for a month and then they will forget a month later, yeah. but you will have to, in some case, have difficult conversations. You might even lose a couple of clients because Mrs. Rossini for reasons that are not clear to you can actually only train on Tuesday at two 30 PM. That is the only time she can train. If you don't offer that session, she's like, well, F you and your throne of gold and all your money. <laughs> so you will sometimes have to make difficult choices to this. I want to get qualified in case anyone's listening to this and feeling a little triggered. It's like, I get it. It's like easy to talk about this in generality. I understand you're dealing with real people here. Um, you can decide if and how to apply this. But I would say if your utilization is, you know, 50%, 30%, that's a real problem. We're offering too many sessions. And if you are a little bit more advanced, what this often means is you're now paying out too much on payroll, right? So yes. you have hourly employees. Yep. Okay. Well, maybe you're not drowning, but you're, you're starving because you're paying out this massive payrolls percentage of revenue to, for these sessions that aren't even full, that don't even need to be happening. Right. So yep. I think maybe I'll pull up there, but those are some of the main ones um, that I look at when I'm analyzing a gym at a glance, if I'm like looking at, if I make people fill out my little magical gym analyzer, um, yep. that those are the it's, ones I tend to look at. No, that's so relevant. And if that's something you're not tracking, I know that's something we looked at a lot when we had our standard like training model at iFast and we could look at our afternoons and granted sometimes afternoons in our market and with our demographic, they'd slay. We're at like 85, 90% right, 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 right. utilization, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. they're jammed. We got a wait list. And yeah. then sometimes mornings, like who wants to train at 10 a.m. or 7 a.m.? Like some of those mm -hmm. weird off hours and yeah. we're at like 50 to 60. Like, okay, yeah. we got to compress that. Second, yeah. in our first show, I don't know if you remember this, but we talked about the 
very unfortunate discussion of rate increases and like oh, the yeah. whole, oh, yeah. we're going to grandfather every, you pay one fifty nine oh, yeah. a month, you'll pay that forever. Oh yeah. Right. Same thing here. People don't like it when stuff gets changed. Yeah. I used to joke around. We could, we gave away free water in bottles for a long time, right? Like the environment hates us, but <laughs> I always joked around. We could switch from Nestle water to ice mountain and it's free water and somebody would be pissed off. Yeah. Right. So yeah, you yeah. change anything, especially when you take stuff away, people are upset. But the, the last thing I want to comment here, because you made so many good points, never discount when it comes to paying yourself the stress of owning a business. Right. Yeah. Like when you're first getting in, you're just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make a little bit more money and I'm going to own my own business and I'm going to be my own boss. And then when you start hiring people, you're like, yeah, but any one of these people could get me into trouble. They could leave at any point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's additional stress. Yes. You get a lot more gray hairs. You age a lot faster when you own your own business. So don't be afraid to compensate yourself for that because that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I would say briefly to the the getting the price right for your market. Um, another, mm -hmm. there's, there's absolutely no pressure. I'm not trying to sell anything, but if you go to Business Unicorn's website, you can get the raise your rates playbook because we've had to do this so often Ooh. because, you know, we work people most of the time. We're like, you're not charging enough money, right? Because if you're not charging enough money on a monthly basis, you can't get the revenues where they need to be. And again, these expenses, things don't matter anymore, right? Because if you're massive or charging, right. you'll never get any of these ratios to, to work for you. So, if you want to go and check that out, it'll give you more details. But basically, you know, there's a handful of considerations when you're doing a price raise. There's a bunch of done for you templates. If you just want to really copy paste and just write in the name of your gym and fill in some of the things that are highlighted for you to fill in. And I would note there is another strategy that sometimes you need to be employed, which is not very fun, which is called which I would defer as a price correction. Because at a certain point, if you're over 10%, mm. certainly above 15%. People are going to notice. Now, the good news is if your prices are right. so breathtakingly low that the dollar amount is not amount, so, you know, it, again, it, it's a little bit subjective is the absolute dollar, the percentage depends on where you're starting from. But sometimes sure. you have to just acknowledge like, I messed up. When we started, it was yes. this. Here's where we're at right now. Here's where we're going in the future. <laughs> Here's how we'll benefit you. But I'm not going to piss in your face and tell you it's raining. I understand some of you might be upset about this. The last thing I want is you could do yeah. what you could do. Um, because I do think like that is a miss that is for many people, one of the first places we want to go to. And there, there are some different numbers I think through based on the model and based on the market of what I usually like to see, but it's not uncommon for a lot of trainers. We open up our gym to undercharge. And I think another thing that we've alluded to a few times, I'll just hammer again one more time. Again, I don't want to sound like I'm being dismissive of people's concerns, right? Like you should care about what people think. If you don't care about what your clients think and you don't care if they're upset or mad at you, <laughs> I'm not the guy to work there. I don't even know, right? Like, <laughs> right. like, like it's okay to be a little upset, but that shouldn't stand yeah. in the way of you doing what is logical and reasonable based on, on any impartial spectators of what is fair or is not fair. You should understand yeah. that there will always be a certain percentage of clients that are upset. And these days I've come to even, you know, get even this granular about it. It's like, you know, if you do a price raise, you're going to have three to 5% of your clients are deeply upset with you and one to 2% are going to cancel in a huff and puff. So if you have a yeah. hundred clients, until you've gotten the fifth email of somebody very, very upset with you, just wait for that email. It's going to come. Just be prepared going to yeah. it emotionally. It's not fun. You know, I should probably create templates for that too. It's a point like I respond like, thank you so much for reaching out. I understand you, boo-boo. Um, yeah. Because ultimately everybody forgets in one to two months. I don't say that to be flippant. I don't say that to dismiss their concerns. I'm not saying that you should just do whatever you want. And then price elasticity is not a thing. You should charge $2,000 a month for group classes. I am <laughs> saying that virtually any change you make will always be met by pushback by the, your clients and your teams. Everybody's going to be against it. And then after one month to two months, no one will ever remember that anything was ever different and everyone go on through life. So similar to letting an employee go, once you get through that, you know, for a lot of you listening, that if you own a gym, if you increased your prices, 10%, 20% next month, you don't incur any additional increases in expenses other than the commensurate increase in merchant fees. That's going to that's gonna change your life for a lot of you. So if you're wildly yeah. off, by, if you're sweating talking through some of these numbers, we might want to go back and, and look at that. And you know, I'll give you another little way to think this, another like benchmark just so people have some real numbers for this is you know, if you're a group model, we definitely don't want to be below 150. We probably want to be more 175 to 200 per month-ish. If you're a small group yeah. model, 
really like to see that 300. I mean, maybe if you're in a yeah. super rural market and it costs you a dollar for rent and you can pay your staff no money <laughs> and you only need like, you know, minimal amounts of money to be killing it, maybe go a little bit lower, but 300, 400, even and if you're in a more expensive market, 500 bucks per month as an average for small group personal training, a six on one model, very doable. Very, very doable. Yeah, there are people, there are sure. people doing it all over the country right now. I promise you. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Another one. I'm super excited to talk to you about this because I know you've been pushing the YouTubes hard lately. And oh, yeah. I respect the hustle because yeah. this is something I very much dabbled in over the years. Like, oh, yeah, I'll post a video just because. Now it's like, no, I actually want to use this. And I really want to try and leverage kind of my yeah. knowledge to try and educate people. So I got two questions for you. First off, what made you want to do that? I just love yeah. to hear that story. And then number yeah. two, what's the end goal of growing yeah. your audience yeah. on YouTube? Yep. Uh, so for the first question, I just thought it would be fun. And I thought it would allow me to leverage <laughs> the proficiencies that I think I have for teaching and for communicating verbally and make, you know, you, and you've seen the YouTube channel. So people that haven't, you go to markfisheryoutube.com. I'll just send you right there and you'll see. It's my usual Mark shenanigans -y thing where I hope it's like useful, credible information, but I'm also being silly and I have an editor who's hilarious who does jump cuts that make me laugh out loud all the time because I usually don't know what he does until they it's They do live. really good job. Yeah. Ken, I don't know who does it, but Ken. they do great work. Shout out to Ken. Ken yeah, good we've, job. We've gotta, you know, and this is another great example, which a lot of you can't leverage exactly this way, but like all I do is I film a video. I give like a 12 minute video <laughs> and I take two thumbnails where my face makes weird faces I put it in a box folder and then that's all I ever do. And then it gets yeah, edited beautiful. and tweaked and I have a producer that will give feedback and fix it. And she works both with an editor and a separate thumbnail creator because that's a whole different skill set apparently. And then they oh, do yeah. the uploading yeah. and then it just like all happens. And then I have a paid digital media buyer that then buys ads to send people to the content to promote the YouTube channel. So savage. So I did it because I love to communicate in that way. And it also becomes helpful to build an evergreen base of content that ideally over time can compound that people can find for forever, forever that I can send to individuals. If they ask me questions that I want to give them like, ah, oh, no, actually here's like a seven minute video, real tight. We'll tell you, here's the 15 places sure. to find staff for your training gym. The goal with it is at least in the short term is to, I mean, obviously make a positive impact and get the word out and hopefully help train gym owners be successful. And then some percentage of them, I don't know, 1%, 2%, 5%, will at some point hire business unicorns for some kind of coaching, right? So yep. that's yep. why, I, you know, I'm not on the YouTube creator strategy, right? Like I'm on the thousand true fans <laughs> strategy of life. It's yeah. kind of always the way I've yep. been. I get it. Like, I'm not for everybody. I'm kind of a weird guy. I get it. I'm also in like the weirdest <laughs> niche ever. It's like friends of mine that are like general business people. You know, I live in like New York. A lot of friends are in Brooklyn. They're like tech backs, entrepreneur types. I'm like, it's like, it's fitness, but like, it's actually gyms, but it's like, it's not gyms. It's actually like training gyms. <laughs> it's so specific yeah. what I do. You so know, it's, it's, it's yeah. you know, I'm not going to be getting like, I'm not looking to add it, monetize it from ads. But my hope is yeah. it's going to be very valuable. People will like it. And if people are interested in working with me, you know, here's the other thing too, is I, I give it all away. There's nothing, there's no like extra secret sauce. Like, oh, you got to sign up for the coaching group, not whatever. Now you're going to get it in a very organized way and you're going to get a, a really thought out process of implementing and you'll work with a coach if you work with business unicorns. But if you just like want to like listen to all the, the YouTube stuff, just like take it, just run with it. Just go make money, have fun. You know, if you feel so inspired, yeah. send me like a, you, if, if, for thanks, send me a nice email about the specific results you want. That'll make me feel warm and fuzzy. Um, but anyway, right. just, it just felt like a, a good way to strat to leverage some skill sets I have. And then, you know, of course, it's a form of like content marketing, right? Which uh, I think most of us benefit from today's day and age. You know, I, I think something that's best with gym owners is a little bit tough because you there's a tendency to want to outsource this if that's not your wheelhouse. But you know, I think it's hard in today's day and age for most of the businesses of our size to avoid being something of a personal brand, right? And there can be downsides yes. to that, right? And I feel very lucky because I've had my cake in it too, where I can be dancing monkeys for two of the three businesses. But like people for the most part aren't, you know, <laughs> like no one signs up at Mark Fisher Fitness and thinks that, like I haven't. You're going to train them. Yeah, like, and I, I don't say this like this, and this is actually like not good. I think it's actually like borderline. Like, I, I need to do a better job of this. I haven't been to MFF. I've been to MFF maybe two times in like the past three months. 
And I even live in Manhattan right. now. Or not Manhattan. I live yeah. in the city across the river. But like I'm like a 25 right. thing. I just don't go there. I just I don't like to work there. I like to work from home. You know, and for me, right. like my wheelhouse is I only do three things all day long as I consume content, books, and podcasts. I'm like a robot machine cyborg. Two, I right. bang out content. I film videos. I do podcasts. I create frameworks. I prepare talks. I give talks. Uh, I create content like frameworks, models. And then three, yeah. I pour love, care, and attention to a small number of hand-selected partners and employees that I want to do everything possible to just input every bit of like love and care and support and development and value into them because largely they're the ones responsible for implementing and operating and doing a lot of the things that are built out of the frameworks and models and content that I work so hard to create. I love it. Dude, that's, that's a great answer. Okay. So you kind of mentioned social media and this is kind of like one of the last big topics I want to touch on yeah. here. A lot of people are confused, right? Again, we can just keep coming back to you. Trainers, coaches, gym owners. Yeah. They're overwhelmed with social media. Oh, you got to do more. You got to post every day. You got to post every three hours. You got to post at 9 a.m., whatever. What are your thoughts here? Like what advice would you give to someone who knows they should be on social media or feels like they should be on social media more but doesn't know where to start? Uh, I, I do think with social media in today's day and age, you do have to manage the minimums. So I do think you need to have a presence on there. And I think if it's a skill set and an interest and a passion, you should go hard. And if it's not, you still got to manage your minimums, right? So at a very high yeah. level, you know, let's talk about Instagram because Facebook is really pay to play at this point, And I'm not as familiar with TikTok, though I imagine some of it would, would track. So for Instagram, you need to have a profile and it's a form of a website, particularly for younger people. They're not going to go to your URL. Yeah. They're just going to look at your Instagram profile. So it needs to be immediately clear who you help, how you help them and exactly what to do next. Same thing as a website. So we have a clear call to action for some next step that's usually in either a link tree or a link in the profile. And, you know, there's an argument to be made for is this for, you know, it's probably not buy a paid trial, but you know, maybe it's an opt-in of some kind, some sort of free something, something. So you get their email address because that's a captive audience, which is a different form of content yep. marketing, which I'm a little bit more partial to. So then the actual content itself, I don't know. If you had a gun to my head, I'd say like, yeah, you probably need like three feed posts per week. You know, if you can do at least one or two stories per day, that's great. I think the most important thing is being consistent. You might not do one or two stories per day. That might be too big of an ask for you because you can just barely get yourself to do it. But also if you batch this, <laughs> if you think about it this way, you're looking at 12 posts per month, right? And again, as far yeah. as what medium you use, certainly vertical video has been the rage. It's looking like maybe that's starting to change a little bit now, but you know, you'll leverage what you're good at, right? So if you're good at writing or if you're good at speaking or you're good at video, whatever, you'll want to consider that. And they just want to get in the habit of doing it, batch it once per month, make sure you have a presence there. And then of course, with those posts, you want to offer calls to action, right? So if you're in the personal training yep. land, of course, the you know very cliche one, which anybody that's been in the space for 10 minutes laughs at and rolls our eyes at because it's so painfully tacky that it's breathtaking, but always works <laughs> is I'm looking for five men and women in such and such town looking to do, 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 do. <laughs> DM me for more, right? We all laugh at it and we all see our friends yeah. doing it. And we're all like, oh, everybody's doing this. And well, that's because it works, right? So I think if you're a personal yeah. trainer, periodically making some call to action with that, in addition to offering content that is value building, which is to say entertaining, educational, um, and inspirational, gives them energy, right? The three E's, energizing, educating, entertaining. Yep. You want to periodically make clear to them, okay, and here's what you want to do next, right? It is a best practice to always have a call to action, but oftentimes it could, the call to action could be things like, you know, leave, drop a comment or your doopa 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 doo, but you do periodically want to make it clear if you're interested in working with me in a more substantive way, here's the way to do that. Do this thing next. So I'll pull yeah. up there. That, that's high level. Uh, you know, I, I'll acknowledge that anybody that goes to Mark Fisher Human Being on Instagram, you'll know I don't really post. I'm actually not interested in doing it. But my businesses do, right? So if you go to Business for Unicorns right. or Mark Fisher Fitness or even Alloy Franklin Legs, you'll see we are running those things. I just, at this point, I'm fortunate to have other people uh, do that. Um, and I want to yeah. really, you know, encourage you if you're like, oh, I just don't want to. Listen, I don't know if there's anything that you have to do to have a successful business, but I think it's hard in today's day and age to not do some of that. And you, the only way around it is through it. You'll probably have to develop enough chops that eventually you can get to where I am and outsource it, but but you probably won't be able to do that if you are a ghost on there. And I'll just say briefly on the right. other side, 
don't let anybody tell you that you have to be the king of social media. You have to be on it like all the time. Cause that's like also yeah. probably not true. If it's not your skill set. I'm just saying you manage your minimums. Like you look weird in 2023. Yeah. If someone goes to your Instagram and they're like, I'm not sure if they're posting. I don't know what you do. <laughs> I can't see your face. Um, so that I do think is an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. I love that idea of just managing your minimums because yeah. like said a lot of people, it's not their primary thing. They don't enjoy it, but you got to do enough. You kind yeah. it's kind of like the cost of doing business these days, right? Totally. Totally. And you can do it efficiently. Again, if you batch it, right. You know, again, it's like 12 pieces of content per month. You can bang out 12 pieces, yeah. you know, and again, in the beginning, it might take a little longer, but if you get better at it, you know, once per, every four weeks or maybe, you know, once every two weeks, set, set amount of time, go back to what we said earlier, put in your schedule. Uh, I'll give you one other final pro tip because people are often like, what am I talking yeah. about? Uh, I am always for all my businesses. I have a list of content ideas. I'm always thinking of things and they're coming from two places. One, I'm continuing education machine, which I know everyone is, but I'm constantly <laughs> listening to podcasts and reading books and talking to pals and going to conferences. So I'm constantly thinking of things I want to say there is one piece. And then two, I'm, I'm constantly having some dialogue with clients. And as I mentioned, listen, I, I'd be, I don't have as much client facing work as I did by any means, but I'm, I am engaging with people in the real world that are asking specific questions and are articulating specific problems. And then I try to create content around here's the problem. Here's the problem or the question that is going to be asked. And I'll try to write it yep. in the words they would do it. And then I answer it and I give them here's yep. the thing to do. Here's how to do it. And then if you're interested in working more and there's always a call to action. If you yeah. don't want to ever yeah. talk to me again, I'm going to miss you. But if you want more, here's the way to get more. <laughs> I used to answer that question so many times every week. What do I write about? What do I yeah. talk about? And literally, well, you're a trainer, right? How many questions did you get asked on the floor today? How many of those would make yeah. killer yeah, content, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, Because if somebody takes the time to ask you, other yeah. people have that exact same question, right? Just make it in a really palatable, easy to understand framework. And then go put that out there in an article, podcast, video, whatever medium is your preferred. Yeah. But yeah, just answering questions, I feel like is a great place to start. Yeah, totally. Okay. Be helpful. Yeah, be helpful. Okay, so we already did the big question, even though it was five years ago. So I'm going to put a twist on it. Hmm. Knowing what you know now, what would, have you, what would you have told yourself in 2019 to prepare for the train wreck that was 2020? Oh... I mean, my impulse is not even anything like tactical wise business where I've just been like, just trying to just, you know, prepare myself to gird up my loins for the emotional <laughs> challenge to come in and just like pep talk myself that, you know, you're right. You take some pressure to make a diamond, right? You're going to be really challenged, yeah. but also on the other side of it, things are going to be so good in ways you can't even imagine because of what you go through. So, you know, that's certainly one piece of it. Yeah, it's funny. It's I, I wish I would have, you know, I wish in this magical scenario, I'm also giving myself something tactical. But in practice, I don't know that I would have done anything really that different. Um, and even the, the you know, really deep sadness I kind of went through, I was like, everything's on fire. Everything sucks. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know, like that in its own way was sort of, I think, probably useful too. And you know, in the reality, like a, a maybe false narrative that I've adopted because it is useful, but I nonetheless really believe my heart to be true is I feel like the main stroke of luck of my life is consistently be given the right amount of stresses, challenges, and suffering that are useful to me, but not so much that they break me or so little yeah. that like I don't get it. And again, get that's better. probably maybe a false narrative. I think it's a useful thing to believed to be true. And, and, and I do for what it's worth mean that sincerely, right? Because there's all, you know, there's a thousand realities with a thousand Mark Fishers. And in some of those realities, Mark Fisher got too much and it didn't go so good. It, it had too many right. challenges. And in some of those realities, he didn't get enough. He didn't get enough challenges and like, he's okay. So yeah. Yeah. So I probably would have given myself maybe some sort of inspiration pep talk, like, you know, you're going to get through this and it's going to be, you'll be better yeah. for it. You'll be better human. You'll be better leader, better dad, better husband for it. Yeah. I, I just like the idea of the Mark Fisher multiverse. Now yeah. I want to have the Mike Robertson multiverse yeah. and all the different iterations there. <laughs> I know it. I okay. Know it. So last but not least, we got our lightning round. So let's start with number one. Tell me again, 
the story about how I helped inspire you to become a full-time fitness trainer, coach, and business owner. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. the <laughs> moment that I knew it was time to stop acting and move into being a full-time professional personal trainer, I think I think you might remember it better than I do. I think it was, was it Bulletproof Knees? There was a specific product. There was I can't remember what knees, it was. Yeah. It was Bulletproof Knees. I remember like getting that and being so bummed because I got an audition for a pilot and I was like, ah, and a pilot for people that don't know, that's like a big fancy audition. Now you're one of zillions yeah. of people getting fancy auditions, but it's still an issue of like a network TV rock. It's a big deal. You want to get on pilots because yeah. then you can get like a TV series and be like, oh yeah. man, I don't, I'm so annoyed. I want to work on this pilot. I want to, I want to. I want, I want to get a bulletproof knees. I got bulletproof knees here. So yeah, so that was <laughs> that was an important signifier to me if I'm being honest with my behaviors yeah. and my values or they, they don't seem to be aligned anymore with what I'm professing to want. Uh, I love it. That, that, <laughs> that just strokes my ego every time I hear that. So thank you. <laughs> so okay, sure. totally true. number two. No, number two, talk to me about Burning Man. No, oh, boy. Like, uh, like that's just like not something oh, that's boy. on my radar. So <laughs> what is it? What... Like, talk to me about that because that's your thing, right? I feel yeah, like thing. every yeah, year I, I, I get some Burning Man. It's a yeah, big, it's a it's a big thing for me. Um, yeah, this is impossible to answer succinctly. You know, I, I one way I flippantly describe it is like the world's craziest people all trying out crazy each other for a week uh, in every <laughs> possible way. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's a, it's a crazy Looney Tune place. I I I. I I say at the risk of, you know, uh, I hope this won't upset people. I, I think it's frankly a, a certain kind of religious person's vision of hell in many ways, frankly. Um, <laughs> but it is the, the most like creative, artistic, playful uh, place. And uh, there's tons of art. And yes, there's tons of partying. And there's tons of just really interesting people out there. And I'll say, for me, the part of the value is once a year, I have this touch point where I leave my life. I don't even have my phone. And for anywhere from six to 11 days, I was on Playa this year, I am able to be present and really connect with a really important community of friends, some of whom I don't get to see often because some of them don't even live yeah. in America and get to right. just really reflect on how is our life? How are things going? What are you struggling with right now? What do you want more of this year? Um, and really just have some distance from your life that can only be afforded by something that extreme. I think you can do that to some yeah. extent if you take like an Airbnb week, but I don't know. I just don't seem to have the discipline outside of the burn to go that far away. And it's such a gonzo, gonzo <laughs> place that that is so powerful to really bring me a lot of clarity on what I really care about, what I don't care about, what kind of changes I need to make. And um, I personally do consider it the pinnacle of my personal development uh, structure for the year. Yeah. No, it just seems like such a cool experience, and I've not heard you describe it like that. Because, again, outward looking in, it looks like it's a big party, right? But yeah, the and way you describe it, it like, <laughs> yeah, and that's fair. That's it totally is, fair. But, like, totally just is. putting the devices away, disconnecting, and disconnecting from that and reconnecting with the people you know, yourself, like being able to tap into that every year seems like it would lead to a lot of unique insights and maybe some clarity in your perspective. Yeah, it, it really does. And it's, I think it's, it becomes this sort of, this really, uh, I think, foundational glue for the community of people that I live in in New York, because admittedly, you know, to some extent, I, I, I might say, although there's no hard bounds on it, the community that I'm a part of this Brooklyn E based, broadly New York City based, but it's kind of an international crew. There's a lot of people that like spend a lot of time in Mexico and in pizza and Lisbon, <laughs> never else on the circuit. Uh, you know, yeah. like a few thousand people made of these subcultures. And yeah, like my camp is like a mini cult, right? Like, so we, it is an incredibly deepening experience. It's also fun to like building a camp is like making a business with your friends. And a lot of my friends are like very <laughs> accomplished. I mean, people like right. dominate a Google sheet. It is like, there's some really calm people <laughs> in this camp. So uh, yeah. it seems like, yeah, yeah. So anyway. It anyway. just, it sounds I fun, like man. It. it sounds fun. Okay, number four, almost done here. How has having a child changed your outlook on training, life, business, anything? Oh, uh, well, I mean, the, the outlook change, I think, you know, everything just kind of means more. Everything means more. I think everything yeah. that, you know, there's, you're doing it for something bigger than yourself. And I 
have to say, I do think I've definitely become more ambitious professionally in part because just frankly, like, you know, raising a kid in New York city area, like for me to maintain the quality <laughs> of life that I want while maintain the both absolute and percentage of savings amount of my income that that, you know, has required me to step it up, which right. has been fun. I think from a health and wellness perspective, yeah, it's hard to say, you know, again, in ultimate reality where I don't have Celestia, I still think at this point in my life, I'm pretty dialed in on the longevity, but no doubt, I think that adds an extra layer of importance and a really desire to be there with her and to be present. And again, I'm on the old dad train, right? My you know, first child was born at 42 years old, right? So for me, right. uh, if I really want to be there with her and have the experience of really getting to know her as an adult, then I have to be crossing my T's and checking my eyes when it comes from a fitness and longevity perspective. And I happen to be very fortunate that, you know, even though my career started as like a fitness professional, I don't actually touch a lot of that. I work with the people that oversee a lot of those things, but it's still a passion. It's a real passion hobby, you know? So I've really spent a lot of time, particularly the past couple of years, really geeking out on uh, the longevity stuff, which, you know, maybe, maybe one day yeah. we can, you know, you can share some thoughts because my, you know, my, and admittedly, I come from a little bit of the, the, at times a little bit surly evidence-based corner of the industry. And um, I yeah. struggle even with my professional background and pedigree sometimes to determine like, okay, is this like really innovative or is this just guy like just ripping everybody off? Cause he's like, ah, if you want to peak right. perform you older rich man <laughs> entrepreneur who's obsessed with peak performance anyway, well, so I'll charge you a lot of money and you've got a lot of money. Yes. So I'll take some of it, your lot of money and then you'll feel like it's valuable because it's a lot of money. Um, you <laughs> That's know, and right. Then, is it health or not? I don't, I don't know. But I do think it's an exciting time as yeah. far as longevity science goes. I think that uh, part of my own mission is I'm spending a lot of like my quote unquote free time, like really grilling, <laughs> spark me like, is this true? Is this actually useful? Is this yeah. stupid? Uh, and of course, there's, yeah. there's, you know, there's no way to find the right answer because I'm trying to triangulate. I'm not an expert and no one agrees. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think the longevity stuff is very interesting. And for listeners, Agreed. you know, I'll give you another like hack too. There is a certain, you know, as clients get older, they're worth a little bit more for you. They have more discretionary income. Their retention is going to be better to stick around longer. And yeah. the, the sort of long-term longevity optimization to the extent that listeners can get into that and you can weave that both in your marketing and sales and weave that into the way you fulfill sessions, you will open up a doorway to a very valuable and frankly, fulfilling kind of client to work with. Yes, agreed. There's not a lot of people that are like, 50 unemployed sitting on their couch that are interested in longevity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah, yeah. just, it, it, they don't connect versus yeah. the person that is 50 and they are killing it and they want to be great, better parents, better grandparents, whatever. And you use the word longevity. They're like, Oh, I want to well, yeah. hear more from this guy you oh, know, yeah. or this gal. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, what's next for Mark Fisher, human being. Oh gosh. I mean, to some extent, I think more of the same, but also less of the same, which is to say, I am excited about a number of fun growth opportunities for all of the businesses. I think all of the businesses are well positioned to do some cool stuff in the next 12 to 24 months and yep. less of the same in that I'm looking to even do more of what I've been doing, which is work even more through delegating and elevating through continuing to find ways to get the things off my plate that are not in my zone of genius. Um, certainly I'll always yeah. be happy to sweep the sheds and there's going to be times where you have to like that, that's the game, right? As the owner. And certainly if you're in the leadership role, which is, I would note again, distinct from the owner, there's something to be said for showing that you are willing to do whatever needs to be done to get the job done. And for me to maximize my leverage more and more, it's decoupled from anything that I do in a given day and more and more a function of the choice I make with who I choose to hire, how I do develop and lead and manage them. And, and that feels like maybe not the right term because some of these people are, are partners. So I didn't want to make it sound like everybody I'm working with is a, an employee. I have a number of people that it's it's more of a partner right. dynamic, but I still think sure. part of my job is to be of service to those individuals, like a small, tight number of people. And I think the more I can tighten up on that squad, free up the rest of my time to consume content, continue to just bury and invest in myself, and then create content around it and models for that small squad to leverage for the various businesses. I think long-term, the more people help, the more impactful we will be, the more opportunity those individuals will have. And yes, on my end, I will get both more freedom and more energy by doing the things I most love. Yes, I will also receive some financial upside, but most importantly, sure. I will feel like I am doing the thing that I'm here to do and I'm making the most impact I can 
with my wild and precious life. So that's what's next. Yes. Dude, such a great answer. Such a great answer. And I don't know whose term it is. They talk about your zone of genius. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I think so many of us were trying to just how long can I stay in this area? Or how much time can I spend in this area? And how little can I spend outside of it? And I just love your thought process on this and really just, hey, man, how much can I cast off and delegate and let other people do so that I can spend more time here? Yeah. So, and, I, and I think where that term came from, just giving uh, attribution, I believe that's from Strategic Coach, which is a program I'm about to start my third okay. year of. And I give them a lot of credit because okay. right? it was going that program. I was like, ah, these are the three things. I don't want to do anything else. I don't do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> and admittedly, I'm weaponizing yeah, laziness. It. Like, uh, I, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> too constitu constitutionally suited sometimes. Like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do this thing. You right. do it. Someone else do it. <laughs> anyway, do it with me. <laughs> I love it. Well, Mark, man, this has been so much fun, dude. Thank you. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you for all the time today. Where can my listeners find out more about you and the great work you're doing? Yeah, I think the uh, if you're thinking about fitness business stuff, that's at businessfunicorns.com. That's also where you can find the aforementioned Raise Your Rates playbook if you want access to that and our template for that. You can also sign up if you're interested in coming to the How Much Should a Gym Owner Make a training webinar that will be happening October 13th and 14th. They can also go to markfisheryoutube.com. And as mentioned, that's going to shoot you right to my YouTube page. So if you want to hear me say words and look at my face move and funny interjections, <laughs> you can do that there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think those are the best places to find me. So, And you can always email me anytime at mark at businessunicorns.com and say hi. I'll say hi back. I'll say hello. Perfect. Hello. So I will make sure I get all those links in the show notes. If you haven't watched Mark's YouTube videos, they are very funny. They are very funny. Thanks and so much. Again, was it Ken? Was it Ken? Yeah, Is he Ken. the editor? Ken's, Ken's, Ken, Ken's my guy. Well done. Ken's my guy. Ken, well done, my friend. And Mark, again, thank you so much for your time, brother. I appreciate it. Absolute pleasure, my friend.